Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. And I want to thank my good friend, uh, Henry Cuellar, who represents the Laredo area in Texas in the United States Congress, and who's been a regular partner with me on trade issues and border issues. Uh, we obviously come from Texas, a border state. Uh, these issues, uh, this humanitarian crisis at the border is personal for us and the people we represent. Um, of course, it was President Obama who first in 2014 called it a humanitarian and security crisis then, and the numbers have done nothing but get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and we agreed with him then, and we still agree with the, President Obama's characterization. But it has now gone from a humanitarian and security crisis to a full-blown system failure. We really are on the brink of collapse at the border. In February and March of this year, a two-month period, more than 180,000 people were apprehended at the border, 180,000 people, a more than 33 percent increase from the worst months of 2014 when President Obama made his comments. Detention beds are at overcapacity. The already understaffed Border Patrol is struggling to meet the needs of the people they, uh, they come in contact with. We know that many officers and agents are pulling double duty. As law enforcement, officers have to become caregivers uh, for children. Customs agents are being pulled off of their duty to process migrants. The uh, non-governmental uh, organizations and community organizations in the communities are unable to keep pace with the volume of people coming uh, through their communities. And cities and counties along the border are bearing the brunt of this influx of humanity. And it shows no signs of abating or lessening. My prediction is the numbers will continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. In March alone, it was 103,000 uh, individuals. In February, it was 76,000. So you can see the trend line. Just recently, we heard from the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce in my hometown of San Antonio that the wait times at the border are costing businesses huge sums of money. And just so people can understand, the ports of entry, like Laredo, have as many as 14,000 trucks go back and forth each day. And of course, the business connections between northern Mexico and Texas and the passage across the ports of entry are an important part of their business model. And so when you have an inventory based on a just-in-time de delivery of parts, for example, car parts or um, medical uh, devices, uh, obviously delays along the border are extraordinarily costly, and the uh, San Antonio Chamber of Commerce puts that figure at $800 million a day. We share their concerns, and um, Henry and I heard that when I was in Laredo just uh, last week uh, from our constituents there, and it has a dramatic impact not only on states like Texas, but I would argue for the entire country, because a lot of these manufactured goods that start along the border region are actually put together finally in, uh, in places like Michigan and elsewhere in the heartland of the countries. So it's pretty clear to anybody who's paying attention that we have a problem and we need to solve the problem. And that's what Congressman Cuellar and I are offering to do today in a bicameral, bipartisan sort of way. We've been told by everybody who's paid attention to the problem from Jay Johnson, President Obama's Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, to the former and current uh, Border Patrol and uh, DHS leadership that they can't solve this problem on their own. They need Congress to pass legislation to update the laws and allow better processing of individuals seeking to come here, including more staffing and infrastructure. That's why we're introducing the Humane Act, which will make the necessary reforms and it includes provisions both from Republicans and Democrats. This is bipartisan and bicameral, as I said. The Humane Act would allow family units to stay together. Uh, the concern about separation of families, we share those concerns, and the Humane Act would enable those families to stay together. But it would also streamline the process of those waiting to have their claims resolved. Many of these people showing up at the border are seeking asylum in the United States, and we know the there's about an 800,000 case backlog in the immigration courts. And so the chances of them ever having a chance 
appearing in front of an immigration judge to assert their asylum claim, some of which are going to be meritorious, many of them will never have that opportunity. Second, this will provide additional safeguards, and this is something I know that was particularly important to Congressman Cuellar, to prevent children from being placed in custody of dangerous individuals. We know that there are instances of children being essentially rented out uh, because they know that the, that, the, that, the, that the smugglers, the coyotes, know that people will be treated differently if they come in with a child. But there's no way of determining, uh, in many instances, whether that is actually the biological child of the adult with them. Importantly, we also mandate the hiring of 600 new CBP, Customs and Border Protection personnel, and require the Department of Homeland Security to establish regional processing centers in high traffic areas, places like El Paso and Laredo. And it will improve the processing of humanitarian relief claims by those being processed at the ports of entry. In other words, uh, it's dangerous for everybody involved to have people coming between the ports of entry in the wild, wild west of, uh, that that represents. And it's much safer and I think more orderly and more compassionate to direct those individuals to make their claims at the ports of entry. Now, we know this will not solve every problem, but it will have a huge impact. First of all, I think it will send a message that uh, there's not free passage into the United States as long as you show up at the border uh, because you've simply overwhelmed our capacity to deal with the numbers involved in any sort of orderly or organized way. But it will also allow the legitimate trade and commerce that is so much the lifeblood, not only of the border region in Texas, but to the country, uh, to continue to, to flow and uh, bringing some order and uh, out of the chaos and hopefully avoiding some of the abuses that we know now re occur routinely when it comes to moving migrants from Central America up through Mexico into the United States. So I'm grateful to uh, Congressman Cuellar for uh, working with me and his continued commitment, not only to his district and to the state, but to the country. He's been an ally, as I said, on bringing a number of common sense reforms uh, from Texas to the federal level. And so it's my hope that we will have an opportunity in the not too distant future to take this legislation up before the Senate Judiciary Committee. and We can reach out to allies in the House and the, and the Senate to try to build support for this and that we will actually get it to the president's desk so we can provide some relief for those struggling to manage this overwhelming crisis. And now I'd like to turn a, the podium over to Congressman Cuellar. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. And uh, again, I do want to thank uh, the Senator. Uh, he and I, for many years from uh, Texas, we've been working in a very bipartisan way. You know, a lot of people talk about being bipartisan. They'll say that but uh, they don't roll up their sleeves and actually get the work done. And I have to say the senator has done that. And, and he and I on trade issues um, and uh, other issues, we've been working together uh, on issues for many years. Uh, the senator did a good job in painting what the legislation does. Uh, let me give you a little bit of context uh, to why this legislation is important. If you look at some of the official numbers, uh, if you look at who was coming in in the southern border in, uh, in 2006. In 2006, over 90% of the people coming in were people from Mexico in 2006. And uh, now you have 73% of the people coming in through the southern borders are uh, immigrants from the Northern Triangle. Notice how that changed from 2006, 90% were Mexicanos, now 73% of them are from those three particular countries. In 2006, family units and unaccompanied kids were 10% of the people coming in into the United States. Now, uh, over 60, uh, 61% of the people coming in are family units and, uh, or, and or unaccompanied kids. In 2006, 95% of the people that came in were returned uh, within hours. Again, because 90% were Mexicanos, so therefore you just make arrangements, work with the uh, Mexican government, and then put them across. Uh, now, over 97% of the people come in, these are 2017 numbers, over 97% of the people stay in the U.S. Uh, and that's because of the uh, system that we have. The 
the system that we have, the immigration system, as to when somebody comes in through ports of entries or somebody comes to the port, goes through a very uh, complicated process. And there's a lot of efficiencies uh, there. And this is one of the things that the senator and I are doing. So I asked my staff, I said, hey, guys, can you break down, you know, uh, break it down step by step when somebody comes in, uh, how, what does it look like? What does the flow chart look like? This is what we're talking about. It's a very, and I think we can share this information with y'all. Uh, we'll be happy to share this with you, and you will see that there are so many steps, and within the steps that we're looking at, it's, there's a lot of efficiencies, and this is what uh, the senator and I are trying to address. Uh, do we have a humanitarian crisis? In my opinion, just like I said in 2014, uh, yes, we do. Uh, you know, we have a lot of people coming in, uh, and in large numbers. In fact, just um, a couple of days, what was it? About 400 people in the fossil sector said, "Here we are, uh, come in." Uh, and this is why I think a wall doesn't work, because they'll come to the riverbank and say, "Here I am," and they'll they'll ask for their asylum and their credible fear. Um, so you have people coming in because they figured out that all you have to do is get to the U.S. border and just ask for asylum or credible fear. Now, how is that affecting also our neighbor to the south, Mexico? Last week I was in Mexico City on a delegation. Uh, we were talking there about the Labor Reform Act uh, that I think I talked to some, some of you all a few minutes ago. It's important for Mexico to pass its uh, uh, Labor Reform Act so we can then uh, look at our, uh, uh, have Congress move forward on this. But when I was there, I sat down with uh, Tunatayo Guillen, and as you know, he is the head of the uh, Mexican uh, Migrant Institute. They deal with, uh, uh, with uh, migrants. And while we're sitting there, I, he got a phone call, and you could see there was something going on. Well, as you, I think some of y'all saw there was about, what, 1,300 people that escaped uh, from a center. Well, he had just gotten a call that 1,300 or so of the people that they were holding, processing, had just broken out, and mainly there were Cubans. Now, the Cubans are coming in, as an example, not coming in because of the wood foot, uh, wet foot, dry foot, as you know, that got changed a couple years ago, but they're now saying the same thing. Just come to the U.S., ask for asylum, ask for credible fear, and it's going to be years before they get to it because, as you know, right now our immigration courts are about 860,000 uh, cases behind, and I think every, uh, almost every week we'll add another 10,000 uh, to it because of the large numbers of people coming in. Uh, the uh, immigration cases are, are behind. So as I was talking to the Mexican officials and to, uh, to uh, the chief of staff, Alfonso, um, uh, uh, Romo, also the chief of staff of the president of the folks. You know, Mexico, what I was trying to relate to them, I said, listen, it's not only a U.S. problem, but if you look at the people at your border, they're not only from Central America, but they are from, name the country, China, India, Pakistan, uh, Cuba, Vietnam, name the country they're coming in. So, you know, what I was telling them, hey, you know, you got to deal now with travel documents and how to fly them back and all that. And, and what I was trying to tell them, at least my perspective, was you got to understand this is a different type of situation. It's not only mainly Central Americans, but they're coming in. Um, and Mexico, I mean, they're not going to be seen as doing the dirty work for the United States, but Mexico's trying to do their own. In fact, they said that their goal is to try to return, uh, hold and return 800 people a day. 800 people a day, that's their goal. Uh, last, in March, they stopped and returned 13,000 individuals. If they go with this goal, they'll be doing a roughly 24,000 uh, a month. And if they keep that up for a year, do the math, you know, you're talking about 300,000 people that would have been coming over to the United States. So we got to work with our friends of the South. It's, you know, we cannot play uh, a defense on the one yard line, which is called the U.S.-Mexico border, work with our friends over there making sure that we don't cut the aid, but increase the aid to Central America. Uh, as you know, we started that $750 million a year, um, and it, it got reduced to 525, uh, 529, uh, 529 million. There was $800 million that been appropriate that's been on the pipeline for a while. Uh, the 500 that we added last year, that's about $1.3 billion that's waiting to help uh, work with those countries. But 
we do want those countries to do a little better uh, in trying to keep the folks from coming over here, work on security, work on other programs so they don't, we just can't give them money and the, and the folks are still coming over here. So uh, there is language that we're looking at to address that issue. So I, I paint this uh, uh, situation because in 2004, if you remember, Senator, we, um, uh, you know, we tried to do something on it, but unfortunately, as you know, anytime you use the word immigration here in the Congress, it, it's hard to get things done. If we would have done something in 2014, maybe the numbers would have been a little sl uh, uh, smaller now. Maybe we would have uh, gotten rid of some of the loopholes that we have. Uh, maybe it would have been different. Bottom line is, I live on the border. Uh, I, you know, I always get a kick out of my colleagues or even uh, 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 administration officials say, oh, I was down at the border for a couple hours and I learned this. Well, I live there. I drink the water, I breathe the air, so I'm there. I talk to Border Patrol, CBP, and, and, uh, every time I'm back there. And one of the things we're seeing is that this, and I'll conclude with this because uh, uh, the senator was right about this point, the immigration issue that we have at the border, and, and now we hear that. I was talking to Betty Flores, member of the, uh, the former mayor of Laredo. She texted me, I'm at a, uh, an awards program here at, the, and, and, uh, at one of the high schools in Laredo. People are asking, what's Congress doing about this immigration issue? People are coming in. You know, that something has to be done. So in an area like Laredo, and Laredo's 96% Hispanic, the most Hispanic city percentage-wise, according to the U.S. Census, people are saying, what is Congress doing? And this is why we're here. But this immigration issue has now become a trade issue, a trade issue because of the, lo the processing center that we have in McAllen, and you get all these family units. Uh, now CBP officers, which I disagree, but they, they moved them over to b basically do uh, care and custody. What does that mean? Changing diapers, making uh, sandwiches, taking people to the hospitals, uh, and, 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 and those are things that those train officials that do cargo inspections, so Laredo does 14 to 16,000 trailers a day. We got more trains than any other uh, place uh, in trucks. Uh, we got more buses than any other place in, in the country. We're number one in buses, we're number one in trains, we're number one in trucks, uh, the number one inland port, second only to LA. So when you take those officers from the, the men and women in blue, to go do custody and care at a border patrol station, then you're slowing down the trade. Hours and hours, and I'll be happy to share videos from drones, uh, uh, from other uh, uh, viewpoints as to how that has affected the slowdown. Uh, and we've been working, the Senator and I have been working on trying to get those CBP officers. They took 545 CBP officers, and therefore if you take those officers from the southwest border, to go do custody and care at a border patrol. Remember, these are customs. Then you know what happens if you take 545. That affects the trade. So this immigration issue has now become a trade issue. And this is why the, the senator and I are, are, are looking at this uh, uh, issue and see what we come up. Senator, I always joke around because we sat down and looked at, let's add this, let's make this change. It was a, it was a uh, uh, um, you know, something we came together. If somebody has a better idea, we've always said that, give it to us. Uh, and if there's a critic out there, then tell us what's better because it, we haven't done anything. Uh, we've seen what's happening in Mexico in the southern border in Chiapas with Guatemala. We're seeing what's happening at the border. We have to do something together, and this is why the Senator and I are here.